Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia, it's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Join Bernard as he shares topics that reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience, including world liberty, the esoteric, suppressed technologies, spiritual ascension, and human consciousness. Humanity has awakened, and our time has come to realize our full potential. And now, live from the Star City, your host, Bernard Alvarez. So, with that, we've got a great show for you today. Um, we are going to be speaking with Wei A. Tsang. Uh, Wei has studied artificial intelligence and computer science at the Imperial College of London. Uh, instead of staying in academia, he went off on an adventure studying the mind, brain, genomics, and consciousness in a more natural and less constrained uh, context. He has spent many years public speaking about esoteric religion, prophecies, neuroscience, AI, politics. He has also spent 10 years working full-time at St. James Church Piccadilly, a center for progressive new age and controversial spirituality in the UK. His talks have been broadcast on national satellite TV and are appreciated all over the world, especially his presentations about the fractal brain theory in consciousness, which is where I got to know his work. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the show today, Wei. Uh, thank you for being here and joining us. Greetings from London. Yes, it's a very, um, very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here and uh, interesting to hear about Winnipeg. I was there the, just, just uh, last year, so interesting memories of uh, it's very cold. I met lots of um, kind of, uh, Aboriginals, uh, the Amer Native American Indians. And it was very flat, so it brought back some happy memories. But I'm sorry to hear about the disappearances. But anyway, yes, uh, fractal brains and consciousness, that's, that's totally my thing, Bernard. Yes, totally. <laughs> and that's right. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, thank you for, uh, for reaching out to me. And uh, actually, you were one of, uh, one of the people that sent us a, a lovely message as well. Um, so, wait, let's, uh, let's start because it, I find it very interesting that uh, here, here you go from studying uh, artificial intelligence, computer science, which, yeah. you know, to me is very linear, logical, into moving oh, yeah, yeah, into yeah. something that's more metaphysical and esoteric. So, uh, kind of what, what brought you, uh, well, what brought you to, to studying artificial intelligence and then transcending that and, and incorporating the work that you're doing now? It's, it's um, I think it's a pattern that many uh, people growing up in the 70s and 80s had. Um, I, was, I was massively, massively influenced by this movie called Star Wars when I was a seven, eight. <laughs> it gave me an introduction to um, mythology, and I guess I guess they took a lot, a lot of the ideas um, more seriously than lots of kids would have done. And then later on in my teens, I got into computers. You know, the home computer revolution revolution in the 80s. And I saw a movie called Blade Runner, which was actually actually influenced by uh, Star Wars. The guy who made Blade Runner was influenced to make Blade Runner from seeing Star Wars. And that kind of set the course of my life. So I kind of had this idea of uh, creating artificial intelligence. And that became my, my, my kind of guiding goal, actually through my teens, but actually through the rest of my life, really. So I went off to uh, study uh, artificial intelligence in London. But then I realized uh, 25 years ago um, that, uh, you know, what they're teaching in academia, in universities, wasn't really um, artificial intelligence. It really wasn't, wasn't the key to, you know, achieving what I wanted to, to do. You know, you know what I mean? So I had to basically leave the formal context to really study on my own. And uh, I had a bit of an adventure, really kind of, uh, you know, living in these really seedy parts of London and getting involved in the quite you know, kind of CD scenes and also working as a musician as well, you know, the kind of, uh, a colorful life. I've had a very colorful life and it's, it's in my, my, my book that I, I came out last year, the quest book, which oh, uh, is this recent, recently, uh, you know, so, so it's actually quite detailed um, kind of journey into the kind of underworld of London. And in that kind of journey, I kind of had these mystical experiences and uh, it's, it's a long story, but uh, I continued my studies in artificial intelligence 
and and the brain. And uh, 25 years later, um, it's become the hottest topic on the planet. So now the, yes, the fact of brain theory, you know, you know, breaking into the mainstream now. So I'll talk about more that more of that later on. And uh, so yeah, so it's been a bit of a bit of a kind of like a esoteric mystical journey in psychedelic trance, working as a musician in one one of, one of the bands. A band called Cosmosis, uh, just traveling everywhere, giving talks, and just really, uh, you, know, you know, learning about life. You don't really learn about life in university, I think. You, yeah. you know, and also you don't really learn about people or, or even the brain. So I think, you know, it's kind of like quite deviant, uh, kind of circuitous path I took to where I'm now. I think I learned stuff that you could just never learn if you, you're stuck in the lab for 20 years. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I happen way. to agree. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to be said for experience. Uh, what is it? Uh, Joseph Campbell says, uh, you, you, you don't, I, I don't need faith because I have experience. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you should mention Joseph Campbell. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. I oh, mean, you me know, too. We, we talked about Big influence <laughs> on my work. Big influence on my work, yes. Oh, but that's, that's fantastic. You know, when he talks about like uh, the power of myth, I mean, I mean, I guess the power of myth is really to inspire young kids or even young adults to really, uh, you, you know, myths really are about, are about kind of communicating spiritual ideas. And I, I guess, you know, the Luke Skywalker thing, I, I guess as, as a teenager, you know, basically I, 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 I basically wanted to become Luke Skywalker. <laughs> become <Jedi Master. laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, um, I, I guess that, uh, helped my, my deviation from the norm. Cause I, I wasn't really just satisfied to do a PhD, and become an artificial intelligence researcher would have been a kind of dead end path to a kind of boring life, really. Right. So it's it's it's, it's great, you know. It's, it's a funny story. I mean, you know, I tell you, I tell you something that a lot of people don't know about this uh, recent craze in artificial intelligence now is that uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, it's called deep learning is what's making the headlines. Is that a lot of the ideas in deep learning is exactly what I studied 25 years ago. Oh, wow. It's called neural networks. So, you know, there's big news about, you know, Google and Microsoft giving away all the technology, but it's actually old technology. Hmm. So by actually leaving academia, I actually saved myself a lot of hassle. But this kind of recent uh, resurgence in artificial intelligence is actually old stuff that I decided 25 years ago isn't going anywhere. And it's kind of made a comeback and it's still not going anywhere. So yeah. I think I, with this uh, fractal brain theory, I've got a totally different revolutionary way of doing things. Uh, it's just now breaking into the mainstream. So I'm very excited about that part. Yeah. So let me ask you then, Way, how did the fractal brain theory come to you? Was it, was it an aha moment or was it something that you worked on over the years or a little bit of both? I, I think it's, it was, okay, um, it started off with just loads of reading about neuroscience and just everything I could get my hands on. When I was 17, 18, I just read like scientific American articles, you know, Nature magazine, stuff I can get in public libraries. And then I was reading kind of thick, hefty books on, on specialized parts of the brain, kind of devouring them, really. But I think in the 80s, there was this kind of like, yeah, there was this kind of real interest in chaos and fractals. And I think I got swept up in that kind of, you know, that, that, that craze during that time in many of the popular science mags, talking about complexity, you know, fractal mathematics and stuff. And it, it became very clear to me that uh, it was a very good way of looking at the brain, so, um, so I, I guess it was, yeah, it was lots of many, many insights kind of building over the years. It's been a really like a, like a really like a 27 year journey really to get, you know, to flesh out this theory to where it's come up, come now. And, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of scientific, um, atheist types are going to hate this, but I mean, a lot of the insights into the fractal brain theory came from mystical visions, <laughs> you know, seeing stuff that you knew was not uh, your imagination. It was stuff that was given to you yes. by a higher, higher intelligence. And these are not intuitions. These are, well, yeah, they're higher intuitions, but they're kind of impressed on, uh, from a higher intelligence. And my, my work is really guided by these uh, the key experiences I had, especially in the late 90s, which really, uh, to me, were, were truth. And, uh, and, and then what I've done in the meantime, in the past 16, 17 years, is, is managed to completely flesh out these truths with all the, you know, the data in neuroscience and mathematics. So that's, uh, I guess, inspiration comes from, you know, William Blake said that, said that the poetic muse, you know, the source of um, art and the source of prophecy is the same source. And even many scientists like Roger Penrose will say that, you know, the mathematicians and scientists reach into this kind of platonic realm for higher ideas. So I guess many of the uh, key ideas of the, you know, the entire knowledge web in your, in your head as a tree, I kind of, I kind of saw in a mystical vision 
And because uh, you see it in, <laughs> in this way, you just know it's true. You pursue that vision. And what I've managed to do in the past 17 years is completely flesh it out into a fully fledged fractal brain theory. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Does I love sense? the process. I love the process. Now, for those of us um, who might be new to your work, is there a, a short way to explain what the fractal brain theory is? It's basically um, a fractal is something that's self-similar. So like Russian dolls, you know, the old Russian dolls look the same, but they're nested within another. But we're talking about, you know, not just a simple nesting. The first fractal doll might be a certain size. Then you have many, many hundreds next size down. And, uh, you know, so, so, so the, the, the parts reflect the whole. So the idea is basically um, there's a way of conceptualizing how the brain works so that's like a neuron, a brain cell is like a tree with dendrites sending signals to the cell body, and then like, like the branches branching out, signals sending out in the axons. So that basic, uh, you know, that basic uh, template of, of a tree, you know, inflow, outflow, and the kind of looping back signal is repeated throughout the brain at all scales, at multiple scales, and uh, even to the level of the entire brain, and even to the level of complex behavior, you know, co behavior stretching over many places over an extended time, and even to an entire life. You can imagine an entire life as an emanation from a fertilized egg. Okay, a tree branching forwards. I mean, everything that's ever happened in your life is an emanation from that point, isn't it? Yes, yes. That, that's kind of, you know, like a kind of continuity. And uh, if you imagine a kind of a tree branching into the future, branching backwards in time, okay, branching back, and basically the two trees intersect. So you have a fertilized egg branching out your entire life, everything that's ever happened in your life, every you know, protein that's ever been manufactured in your body, every random nerve firing, every purposeful behavior. And there's this other tree coming backwards in time. Basically, the point of this other tree going backwards in time is the act of fertilizing eggs. Isn't that beautiful? That is absolutely cosmic. very cosmic. <laughs> it's tantric. Very beautiful. Very be a beautiful observation. Absolutely. So, I, from a neuron to all levels of brain architecture to an entire life, it's basically a tree, and to and even to the universe, a cosmic tree. Which is a very powerful symbol that is used and has been used for thousands of years in uh, esoteric uh, studies. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, so maybe later on in the discussion. I mean, but the idea that uh, you know this way of looking at the brain as a fractal, and also the idea of a fractal universe, and the idea of uh, the universe as a as a giant brain, they really go hand in hand. So it's really the revival of these ancient ideas. I mean, in Hindu holy texts, as is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. And as is the atom, so is the universe. As above, so below, and all that kind of stuff. You know, the image of God. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, just the idea is the complete return of one of the key concepts in esoteric religion. And I'm I'm happy you brought up the uh, the idea of the universe being a giant brain because there has been a lot of uh, talk about that over the last couple of years and. I think it, it demonstrates beautifully what you're discussing here. Uh, what are your thoughts on the idea of the brain, the universe communicating with other parts of the universe? Exactly, yes, exactly. It's, it's, it's amazing how um, many uh, strands in modern science really converge with ancient, ancient mystical ideas. I mean, uh, you know, many years ago, there was this thing called uh, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which basically extrapolates uh, Schrodinger's wave equations regarding the subatomic to the entire universe. Okay, so that's, that's one example. Microcosm becomes macrocosm, atom becomes a universe. And also, but, but more recently, uh, yeah, there, there's these findings of kind of simulations of the entire universe and the interactions between, you know, uh, the, the masses in this uh, simulations of the universe reflects interactions in kind of networks on, on the planet, like neural networks and the internet. So this idea, and also the idea of, of a, a purposeful universe, and uh, say the physicist Paul Davis, who's actually well regarded even by atheist physicists. I mean, he's actually talking about putting the idea of meaning and purpose back into cosmology. And the idea of like, you know, time symmetric quantum mechanics and physicists, cutting edge of physicists who are not, you know, necessarily spiritual or have a kind of mystical agenda. They're talking about a destiny wave function emanating from the future. Which is you know, exactly like our tantric point in the future, you know, fertilizing eggs and kind of, you know, <laughs> and emanating from a fertilized egg. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the idea that, uh, you know, our bodies and our minds are a perfect reflection of the universe is really where science is heading, I believe. 
that's very exciting. That is very exciting. It, it, it reminds me of a quote I forgot who said it a, a way back was that, you know, the, the, the esoteric and the metaphysical is merely science that has not yet been discovered. That's, that's beautiful. Yes, ab absolutely. Yeah. The funny thing is, I mean, um, you know, science actually came from the mystical. You know, people like Pythagoras, the philosopher who coined the words cosmos, philosophy, and mathematics. I mean, he was absolute uh, uber mystic. You know, you, you have, obviously have Newton, uh, you, your Francis Bacon's, and your, um, you know, Leibniz. So it's a, it's a beautiful uh, kind of full circle kind of thing that if science uh, and even technology came from kind of mystical musings of these kind of very spiritual people, that's kind of, kind of come full circle back to the spiritual where, you know, this idea that uh, the, the destiny of science is to become sacred. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's kind of an inevitability about it. I think, you know, the, the science uh, the science and religion debate is such a hot potato right now. It's such yes. a, that's really kind of, um, I, I, think, I think the future depends on this uh, kind of debate being won on, on the kind of spiritual side, really. You know, even Richard Dawkins says that, uh, you know, regarding, say, selfish genes, and these kind of scientific doctrines, he re recognizes that basically he's, he, you know, this is uh, qu quite shocking when I heard it, that he says um, he's a passionate anti-Darwinist when it comes to applying selfish genes to living our lives and organizing society. So, you know, the idea of applying ideas of, from science into, um, into organizing society has kind of often in the past led to doctrines like communism, like Nazism. And I think um, the idea that, uh, you know, ideas like progressive politics, ideas of progress, the ideas of um, inalienable rights, ideas of human dignity really came from es esoteric religion. So I think, I think there's kind of higher stakes than just uh, artificial intelligence or kind of, uh, you know, nice uh, <laughs> mystical esoteric way of looking at the universe. I think the implications for the political realm are, are quite huge, I think. Yes, they are. They are. And um, uh, with that being said, uh, let, me, let me move the, the conversation forward a little bit into the idea that humanity is going through a great paradigm shift, that we're going through right. an awakening or, or moving into the golden age and how perhaps some of these, uh, these theories coming back now or, or, or even new ones that are being accepted into, whether it be mainstream spirituality and or politics, uh, could easily be a, a part of that, that human spiritual evolution perhaps. What are yes, your right. thoughts on the on this great paradigm shift? Do, do you see it? Is is it happening? Is it something we're creating in our minds because we want to see it happen, or, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, completely. I mean, relating to um, yeah, the idea of science converging back to the sacred, people have been expecting this paradigm shift. And I remember 2012, there's a kind of feverish, feverish expectation. And um, oh, yeah. I, th I think even secular folks, I mean, even, even like um, Ron Paul says there's needs for an intellectual revolution. When we talk about paradigm shift, we're really talking about like kind of you know, new Weltanschauung or worldview. Weltanschauung is a, is a German word. It means kind of worldview, but a worldview as a kind of organic whole so every all, all the kind of ideas of a society moral legalistic scientific artistic philosophic and you know integrated into a kind of holistic organic whole and it kind of had a kind of like mystical connotations so what i see is really um the ideas of this world are really dysfunctional and that's what's really killing the planet you've got your neoliberalisms your selfish genes your iron rand doctrines and your materialism your religious fundamentalisms and it's really uh, it's like an impasse unless you really challenge these ideas with a new worldview a paradigm shift then i think there, there is no future quite frankly so i think it's prophetic you know i think it's really you know, you know the idea that the word apocalypse translated from greek literally means the unveiling of the hidden thing so I believe that this paradigm shift is this unveiling of the hidden thing. And if you can unveil this hidden thing, which is basically everything that science hasn't yet explained, you know, the hidden thing, the God and the gaps that science hasn't explained and the hidden thing of the apocalypse and the hidden thing of esoteric religion, the esoteric hidden religion, if you kind of see them as one and the same, it's a beautiful kind of vision of the future that that which science hasn't explained, which is brain, mind, mm. genome, cosmology and consciousness once it's fully explained basically the, the explanation is the complete return of the esoteric religion the perennial philosophy the prisca theologia for the 21st century so i see it as a kind of inevitability and that really i i believe is the key to you know pushing through this paradigm shift and along the way uh, with the paradigm you know this kind of foundations of the new paradigm come 
the revival of these kind of Renaissance Enlightenment uh, kind of political ideas and norms, which really gave rise to America, gave rise to the American and French revolutions, and gave rise to the kind of things we, uh, the kind of things that have been eroded now, things like the idea of inalienable rights, human dignity, you know, the idea of kind of like equality before the law. So I think it's a, it's a huge uh, kind of raft of ideas, and that's the kind of like the paradigm. So it's not a single idea, but it's the entire shebang, you know, it's the entire Weltanschauung, the entire holistic uh, whole, uh, kind of integrated organic unity of ideas that's needed to really challenge the existing ideas of this world. And does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I agree with you wholeheartedly with, with everything you just said. Uh, my question is, and, and or my take on it is, I should say, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are, are okay. that this particular, let's say this, we'll call it the quote, the great paradigm shift or the great awakening uh, has a, sure. I, I want to say it has an intelligence of itself that it seems to, uh, I don't know if it, it, it seems to move forward uh, at a rapid pace sometimes. Sometimes it seems to be moving forward very slowly. Sometimes it seems to revert. But um, what are your thoughts of it being its own intelligence, that the, that the great paradigm shift perhaps could be the collective unconsciousness of humanity uh, bringing about its own spiritual evolution? Well, definitely um, in my talks and my writings, I use the, the expression the hand of providence a lot because, because uh, you, you come to believe in it because of synchronicities, just coincidences that are not coincidences. So basically I see, the, I see a kind of intelligence guiding human affairs, even though it doesn't seem guided. It seems like a complete mess when you open the news and yeah. watch the you know, kind of recent kind of political Republican debates. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's it's the circus. <laughs> It's almost a circus. It's almost like the, the world is chaos, you know, all the kind of things happening on the environmental, ecological uh, s spheres. And you think, where is, pro where is the hand of providence? Where is the higher intelligence? But I think, I, I, think, I really believe that uh, the, you know, the prophecies in world religion are really talking about present times. You, of course, you have 2012, but it's, it's all the re world religions. It's all the kind of, you know, kind of indigenous native traditions. What all saints yeah. about now. So, yeah, definitely, I believe there's a kind of guiding force. And sometimes, like Joseph Campbell says on the kind of uh, mystic journey, sometimes the, the way seems muddled and seems like a mess. And uh, when you look back on things, that you see a kind of pattern. So looking back on history, I definitely see this kind of pattern whereby uh, a kind of things are happening in the kind of like uh, in the world, which are kind of preparing the way for this great revelation to happen. And we'll, we'll play our you know, kind of respective roles, I think. And I think it's a collective effort. It's a kind of like collective effort to we'll, we'll raise consciousness. Another meaning of the word apocalypse, um, you know, unveiling of the hidden thing was that the ancient Greeks involved the Eleusian mysteries, you know, just kind of drank this kaikion thing to become unified with the deity. So you had your mystical experience on a kaikion, this kind of mystical brew, the LSD of uh, ancient Athens, you know, the Eleusian mysteries. Basically, they called that apocalypse. So yeah. it's like, so we have a kind of personal apocalypse, a kind of personal awakening. And then we have a kind of, uh, a kind of historical revelation of kind of, you know, this paradigm. But then I think uh, on a kind of like planetary level, there is this kind of like, yeah, planetary consciousness. I think there is this kind of like field, which is kind of guiding human affairs towards the realization of the prophecies. And it's quite scary because the, you know, the prophetic archetype is the kind of mythic archetype. It's this kind of cosmic battle between light and dark. So I think it's going to get a bit, it's going to get a bit darker and then yeah. it'll get very, very bright. Wait, uh, we have a commercial break coming up right this second. Uh, when we return, we're going to continue. Now, back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. Welcome back to the Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are here with Wei A. Tseng, and we are talking the fractal brain and a lot more. Um, just before the break, we were, on, we were on a roll. We got kind of cut off. Did you complete your thought there, Wei? Oh, I was just going to say, um, it's going to get worse before it gets better and uh, oh, yeah. I, you know donald trump popped in my mind i just thought that he could be the next u.s president <laughs> yes a, a reality star a crazy crazy reality star <laughs> I, I mean it's it's a it's a downward spiral i mean you know he kind of makes uh, george bush jr look like a like a wise statesman <laughs> exactly you know and it's, it's funny it's, because it's i funny. i 
I have so many, um, you know, I, I'm voting, uh, well, I'm voting for the Jewish socialists, you know, and I have so many people on the left telling me, well, if uh, Trump or um, Ted Cruz wins, it's your fault for not voting for Hillary. And uh, I'm like, you know what? Well, maybe if we get a psychopath, a more of a psychopath, it'll shake things up enough to make people stand up and do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think uh, sorry, psychopath. Who you referring to? I think the uh, the pretty much on the psychopathic level. I mean, Hillary Clinton isn't that much, but you know, no, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm cynical. I mean, it's uh, when I when I heard her say about you know Colonel Gaddafi wasn't a, an amazing guy, but hear, hear her say you know we came, he died. You know, famous like uh, off take from from TV. Did you ever see that? Yes, yes. <laughs> I thought that's that's going to be the president of the U.S. You know, you know, we came, he died, and kind of, and she kind of, she kind of chuckles, and I think that kind of turned me off for a ride off. You know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I hope Bernie Sanders wins, but I uh, fingers crossed. You know. Yeah, absolutely, and and well, it's rigged as well as we always say. The game is rigged. Speaking of being cynical. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean, over here in the UK, completely. I mean, we have uh, you, you know um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's like our, our UK, you know, Bernie Sanders, and he's basically the the entire press, the entire establishment, have just have their knives out for him. Every single tiny little thing becomes a point of criticism. So yeah, I mean, the system being rigged. The same over here in the UK as well. Absolutely, Unfor- unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I want to go into this more. But I, I know that uh, you've have you've been doing you're continuing your work. And you've had some developments over the last year. I was wondering if uh, you could share some of those with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because I was working in this church for 10 years. And even though it's an amazing church to work, I mean, funny, I mean, you know, know, Bill Clinton, people like Hillary Clinton would come to that church. People like uh, even like Lord and Lady Rothschild would come to that church. It's a funny church in in, in London. I mean, basically, I met lots of interesting people. After 10 years working there, it's... uh, it's a full-time job and I got a young family. So it kind of like slowed progress on the fractal brain for it. But since, since quitting my job a year and a half ago, things have absolutely rocketed ahead. It's very exciting. I mean, there's some of the recent developments in a nutshell. I mean, what, what I've managed to do in the past year, kind of past year, six months, it's very, very exciting is that, uh, okay. It's a fractal brain theory. So the, 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 the parts reflect the whole. Okay. This is really exciting. Yes. What I've managed to do is to basically take the fractal subcellular, so that, okay, with this kind of way of looking at the brain and with this kind of mathematical framework I've worked out to understand how uh, fractals apply to the brain, basically, within the genome, I DNA and the genes within each cell, okay, with this uh, math, math, mathematical way of looking at things, genes are exactly as neurons. Gene regulatory networks are exactly as networks, and a genome is exactly as a, as a tiny little fractal brain. There's more. It goes on. This is really exciting. The process of ontogenesis, which is the amazing, uh, you know, process, an ancient uh, kind of scientific, well, old scientific puzzle of how a fertilized egg becomes a body. That's ontogenesis. It's a miracle. A fertilized egg becomes a baby, becomes a human being, okay, which relates to the even more ancient and older kind of uh, (laughs) scientific puzzle of getting the eggs fertilized in the first place. But anyway, so... You have a fertilized egg and that becomes a body that's called ontogenesis now okay with this new uh, breakthrough in the uh, fractal brain theory i can now show that thought and behavior produced by the brain is exactly as a body produced by a fertilized egg oh, and wow. there's more and there's more the process by which thoughts and behavior becomes changed i.e creativity and learning is exactly as the process by which genomes and the process of ontogenesis becomes changed by the, by evolution. You see how it all fits together now. Yeah. Wow. That's quite a discovery. What a way, what a, what a way to, well, I, I guess layer the, uh, the patterns on top of each other. And the, the really uh, fun part is that the, you know, the, the genomic uh, knowledge has really only come about in the past uh, five years. So when I, when I talk about, okay, it's an old idea, the idea that uh, evolution has something to do in the brain, with the brain, you know, neurodarmanism, MEMS, and genetic algorithms. So it's an old idea. What's completely new, okay, with, with uh, my insight is that uh, there's recent discoveries on the kind of to do with molecular biology, how evolution actually works. I don't have to go into details, but it's, it's, it's very new and it's newly discovered within the past five, 10 years. 
what the fractal brain theory now does is incorporate those latest findings and totally makes uh, finds the correspondence between these uh, kind of genomic, you know, kind of molecular processes with what's going on in the brain. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, and and, and uh, so we have basically a perfect fractal of what's happening in our minds and our brains completely interpolating into the genome. But also what's really exciting, it makes even more compelling the idea of a brain unified brain genome theory extrapolated into new, to the universe. So a perfect you know, extrapolation into the universe and interpolation of the universe into the brain and the genome. And it's, Which then, it's, it's awesome, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm so oh, excited. Wow. I mean, uh, yeah, funny, uh, I gave this talk uh, in Winnipeg. It's funny, back to Winnipeg last year to uh, a kind of... Um, you know, kind of auditorium packed with neuroscientists and neurosurgeons in, in their green smocks about to go into the, the lecture theatre. It's a Friday morning and uh, kind of neurologists and psychiatrists. And the talk went down a storm, you know, really enjoyed it. They flew me over, nice hotel, nice food and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, it was really like a like a treat to to give the talk. And then I, I went to some of the genome stuff and I shocked them because I, I said there's a big huddle around me. And I, I said, I, I said, uh, yeah, isn't it great, guys? The, the, and, I, and these ideas, I've just made it all up. <laughs> 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 and their jaws dropped, <laughs> as I say. And then I had to reassure them, yeah, guys, I mean, yeah, I just, I just literally made it all up because all these, this information is completely new. And I, I didn't make it on the spot, you know, standing here. I mean, you know, I did it in the past you know, six months or so. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> So, so it's exciting, yeah. It's exciting, and it's also uh, kind of. Um, I, I think it takes the kind of razzle dazzle, kind of wow factor of the theory to a new level. But it also uh, this extrapolation of the brain theory to the universe is, is really the key to. Uh, I think uh, another mutual interest we have is the consciousness thing. Mm -hmm. So and I think I think you know once you. Go on, you go. You go. I was going to say I, I can't help but wonder once we once we've discovered. How, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, um, once we've mapped it out, which it sounds like that's what you're doing, you're doing a wonderful job of, of mapping out uh, these, um, you know, these patterns and how they can be layered on top of each other. Yeah. Uh, what it is that we're going to be able to do uh, as a as humanity or as human beings once we actually understand the the dynamic and the design. I mean, we're talking. For me, it's almost like uh, bringing the metaphysical design into a physical form. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me say one thing uh, as a kind of reassurance. I mean, it leads to artificial intelligence, basically. But let, let me say that there is a finite mind and there's an infinite mind. So, so the finite mind is basically our normal consciousness. Is what we is what we use to fill our tax forms to drive our cars down the street. You know, to navigate life. You know, you know what I'm saying? And that's our finite mind. And that's what we create in artificial intelligence. But there's also an infinite mind where we can't become one with God. Now, okay, I, I think we're kind of um, almost like touching on, upon the consciousness thing. Yes. One of the major implications of the brain theory is, uh, is um, okay, one of the key ideas in, in the brain theory is, uh, is recursive self-modification. Now, let me explain that. It's really on the cutting edge of mathematics. It's really... What is really what's missing in mainstream artificial intelligence research? So they know they know it's really important, and uh, people suppose that recursive self modification kind of occurs when when they have an artificial intelligence of sufficient complexity. And we know in our minds we recursively self modify ourselves through learning. Now the thing is, um, the recent uh, breakthroughs of made in genomics uh, shows that the new evolutionary ideas can only be understood in terms of recursive self-modification, which is the idea that evolution evolves evolvability. It's like you know the function changes itself to make itself evolve better, and also the process of ontogenesis, you know, uh, as a cell divides uh, from a fertilized egg. If you imagine DNA as a function, then epigenetically that function becomes recursively self-modifies. It so recursively self modifies itself. So it's actually fundamental to how genes work, but it's also how fundamental to how brains work. And I believe it's also fundamental to how uh, you know artificial intelligence works. The much talked about technological singularity, the uh, what's called the apocalypticism for nerds. It's going to be so dramatic. Mm -hmm. This advent of artificial intelligence. I mean, even atheists are talking in biblical terms. Of, you know, it's apocalyptic. 
Stephen Hawking saying it's going to be the biggest event in human history. Mm -hmm. You know, summoning the demons, says Elon Musk, and it could be the end of humanity, says a whole bunch of other scientists. So if we kind of imagine that, uh, you know, the technological singularity, yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it is biblical, but it's also recursive self-modification happen, happening on the planetary scale, involving the entire world world industrial scientific technological base involved involved in the entire world society and political economy so you you see it's a very powerful idea recursive self-modification it's actually really powerful part of the fractal brain theory now which is what's actually lacking in uh, modern brain science and theoretical neuroscience and uh, an artificial intelligence amazing absolutely amazing and and very exciting as we continue to to dive into this realm of of consciousness and and uh, uh, artificial intelligence um now wait we 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 we've only got about 15 minutes left and i wanted to uh bring up the idea because uh, we touched on it a little bit at the beginning but i feel yeah. and we just talked about you know the, the evolution of of gene and dna but also the evolution of society and politic and how right. how right. you feel we're seeing a bit of a renaissance of uh, progressive politics in the way that uh, the Rosicrucians or even the Freemasons of uh, the Revolutionary War area uh, era uh, were 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 focusing on philosophically, such as the Bill of Rights and fundamental rights for all humanity. And how how do you see that occurring? And what how do you see the um, the similarities uh, presenting themselves today? Right. I think it, what we see in uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the, the, over here, the rise of, you know, kind of uh, these kind of uh, socialistic thoughts and also of um, of Bernie Saunders in America is really dissatisfaction with kind of a laissez-faire capitalism, you know, kind of a selfish genes mentality, absolute selfish, selfishness as a virtue. So I think I think I think there's kind of like a resurgence in interests in kind of other ways of doing things. Now I, I got I got to say um, it's funny. I I, I live in a kind of left wing central. I live in North London, and uh, I, I literally live a, a kind of like a stone's throw from Karl Marx's mausoleum. And uh, you, you know uh, it's <laughs> North London. Uh, you know Jeremy Corbyn is the MP from the the, the district just down the road, and uh, Ed Miliband, who was the uh, ex Labour leader, you know left wing progressive politics supposedly in the UK. He, his son is in the same school as my daughter, so this is really his left wing central. Wow. But I have to say that socialism really went wrong with Marx, and I, I got to say that uh, many kind of socialistic ideas are really I, I don't really agree with them. But what I would say is that you know socialism came from from a root, and my neighbour across the road, he's a, he's a great guy. He works for the UN, you know, helping uh, kind of like uh, he basically uh, uh, examines the health of, of people who receive food aid. So it goes to all the worst places in the world to to help people. But anyway, he he's a, he's a Marxist, and he's saying that Marx is saying they have to go back to Hegel now. Some modern thinkers. But it really had to go back further, and I believe the root of progressive ideas. Well, I don't believe it's a fact. The the root of progressive politics, the very idea of progress itself, the idea of inalienable rights, the idea of really humanistic values, really came from a kind of mystical resurgence that happened in Florence in during the Renaissance. So I think, and even the teachings of the prophets, the you know the it's, I know it's hard to believe for some people, but the original. A kind of mission of Muhammad was progressive. He gave women rights. He gave, you know, women property rights and divorce rights, and actually made society better. And also the teachings of Jesus and Buddha. What's what's common to all these strands, which actually progress society and give people this idea of, you know, equality, liberty, fraternity, of meritocracy, of you know, kind of like a universal justice. Really comes from a kind of metaphysical understanding of who we are, and it's not an understanding that we're meat machines or selfish genes. It really is an understanding that one, uh, even the you know the Catholic Catechism would say that uh, human dignity arises from the idea or the fact, the belief that uh, we're made in the image of God. But there's a there's a deeper, deeper mystical idea, which was quite prevalent during the Renaissance, and which you know many Freemasons and Rosicrucians believe in in the past and even today essentially it's the idea not just that we're made in the image of god but also that god is inside us and that somehow somehow we are god essentially <laughs> and it's, uh, so that's the really the key 
metaphysical assumption that really gave rise to the left wing, as, as it was originally understood during the French Revolution. And I think that's what's really missing. If you, if you uh, kind of, without this kind of metaphysical underpinning, then really these ideas of progressive politics, progress towards what, you know, what was the human being, they don't make sense. So I think we have to go right back to the roots of progressive politics in order to revive the kind of true socialism of your, you know, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and you know the kind of uh, you know the true kind of uh, society that the original founders of America, the kind of you know, Rosicrucian ideals, the Freemason ideals of a, a kind of really just uh, you know, kind of united spiritual society. And I think that's really the future. I think uh, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, what they're doing is great. They're symptomatic of this kind of desire for something better than the, the kind of like, laissez-faire capitalism that's really destroying the planet. But I think it's uh, really to unless you revive these core metaphysical truths, unless you can actually instigate this re-renaissance and re-enlightenment for the 21st century, then I think it's going to be a real uphill struggle against you know, you know, the kind of the dominant forces of this world. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and with that, I, I want to say that uh, it's funny because um, doing the work that I do, I'm very vocal about my beliefs as far as human equality, nice. human rights and whatnot. And I, I personally do get attacked at, as being a, a liberal or a Marxist or back, you know, last, oh, really? year, <laughs> last year socialism was still a bad word. It's not so much a bad word <laughs> in the U.S. today. But uh, and, and for me, they're not political. Those 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 um, those thoughts that I have or those philosophies that I have of equality for humanity and and for all people to 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 live in, you know, basically live in harmony and a, in peace with each other. Is, right. is a spiritual thing. It, it is a metaphysical thing. It has nothing to do with politics. And unfortunately, many of the politicians have, um, well, once we put it into the realm of the political arena, then we start seeing the power play. And I think maybe perhaps that's where, right. uh, you know, maybe that's where Marx went wrong, you know, <laughs> where, where, where yeah, we'll oh, definitely, the, yeah. <laughs> the powers that be take it over and then use it as a, as a power struggle versus something that is innately within all of us. I believe that everybody has those beliefs innately, but perhaps because of uh, external influence and or you know, programming through the media or through our families or through our communities, uh, we've come to repeat over and over again those Ayn Rand philosophies that you're speaking of, that, that selfish okay. idealism. Uh, but I don't feel that that's, that's a natural state of being. So I feel that this whole movement toward progressive politics is really an unfolding of our true inner beings uh, of, of, of understanding uh, that unity consciousness, of understanding that, that wholeness of what we are. Does that make sense? Yes, that's, that sounds absolutely right. Yes, uh, you know, articulated in a different way. That's exactly what I believe. I think it's, uh, you know, if uh, the kind of the values of the Renaissance and Enlightenment were lived, if they're actually ingrained in, in society, then basically you wouldn't need laws, you wouldn't need politics. <laughs> I believe that. So politics and, you know, laws and this kind of, you know, kind of like even, uh, you know, stages of uh, capitalism are really kind of paths to something better. And it's not, you know, it's not Marxism, it's not to kind of old socialisms. I think it's something that's going to be uh, more akin to what's prophesized. So I think uh, you know, if you've got apocalypse, uh, you know, this technological singularity is this apocalypticism for nerds. I mean, it's going to such a physical transformation of the planet it's going to completely transform things in, in the solar system the universe then i think that's that's our new earth isn't it from the physical transformation they shall hunger no more they shall thirst no more the sun shall not strike the any scorching heat now if we had this kind of like the other side the new heaven which is really the old heaven the heaven within if we can actually revive that for the 21st century then we, i think, think we have a kind of like full house i think we have a kind of full <laughs> kind of kind of realization of the prophecies for the 21st century i think that's the kind of like the destiny of humankind and i think you know these things like yeah as you say politics and laws are just kind of like necessary well not i mean they're, they're corrupt uh, forms and uh, but kind of like just uh, stepping stones to something better when we were actually when we actually have the kind of like politics we have today and but something in the future far far better i believe absolutely absolutely and, and I, i'm so glad you said what you just said because i do feel it's important for all of us to kind of be able to visualize what that's going to look like. And I feel that, you know, human behavior has a tendency right. to fear change and uh, to remove that yes, fear yes. of change. We need to be able to uh, illustrate uh, what's it going to look like. What what does a world with Corbyn and Sanders look like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not as scary as people think. <laughs> Well, that's a very important point, and I think you got to inspire people to think about, uh, you know, kind of revolutionary movements and uh, kind of progressive um, social movements. You have to really visualize what the the society looks like. And in 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 the past, I mean, what was I mean, what you need is basically utopian vision. But what you need is a utopia that people can actually believe in. But then you need a game plan to get there. So I think you know this kind of like uh, you know what's happening with with technology. Yeah, you know, at the dawning of technology, we talked about science, but at the very dawning of technology, which was led by people like Francis Bacon, who, uh, you know, kind of uh, alleged Rosicrucian probably was, right. but it doesn't matter whether he was or not, because his writings were identical to Rosicrucian writings. He believed in the same things. Um, and also the Rosicrucians themselves, they believed in the search for this panacea, this cure for all, along with the reform of all human knowledge and abolition of monarchy. But then Francis Bacon also wrote uh, that science, the purpose of science was to, uh, quote, bring forth a progeny of sp- a spring of progeny of invention that may overcome and subdue to an extent our needs and our miseries. So what's he talking about? He's talking about technology. Yeah. Now, if, uh, we come to this kind of like, uh, really, uh, this kind of consummation of history in this kind of, you know, apocalypse, apocalypticism in every sense of the word, and then this kind of like uh, technological singularity brought about by artificial intelligence. I mean, what is it by the ultimate technology? And what is it about? The, but it is the, the Vosicrucian panacea. I mean, it's the mother of technologies. It's the technology that creates technology. It is the invention that invents. Obviously, it's it's it is a kind of like a, it has to be handled with care, obviously. Absolutely. But I think if you actually bring this kind of like a revelation, a kind of a new insight, paradigm shift, and this new technology to the world, accompanied by the kind of like values, progressive values, which created the you know the, the foundations of America and really gave rise to the initial enlightened stages of Islam actually gave rise to the European enlightenment then by creating this re-renaissance and re-enlightenment for the 21st century can you really give a, the kind of proper context for this kind of technological singularity to occur so I, I think I think yeah I think you've got to basically visualize it for people and say this is what's going to happen it's going to be space travel it's going to be you know kind of like technologies like you wouldn't believe it's going to be uh, kind of longevity it's going to be you know all the things you can possibly imagine it's going to be Star Trek but but better <laughs> wonderful <laughs> it's going to be way. Star Trek with enlightenment <laughs> we're 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 out of time and uh, I want to thank you so much time for you. my God program. yes yeah. absolutely my God thank when you for being fun on the program twice. and uh, I'm wondering is there <laughs> a, a website that is there a website people can go to. Yeah, uh, www.iawwai.com. And also the new uh, well, last year's Quest book is actually on Amazon. Just type uh, Quest Sang and you'll find it. So Quest on Kindle. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was truly a pleasure. It's a pleasure. We'll see all of you next week. We'll be speaking with Joe Martino from Collective Evolution here on the Just Bernard Show next week. Have a great week, everyone. We love you very much.